Connections build communities, and Rachel Andrus is all about connecting good people with good people. Listening to each other's stories and experiences could open up hope for someone else. She believes sharing not only empowers you, but those who listen may feel like they're not on an island alone. Rachel is about inspiring change and seeks to awaken potential in others. Each week, she interviews friends who've chosen to live their life with purpose and meaning. It'll be fun, encouraging, and a wide diversity of beautiful humans. Humans. You're invited to be inspired in hopes to spark the light inside of you. We hope you enjoy it. Here's Rachel. You know, part of what I, what I do is I love helping people elevate their health, helping people feel comfortable in who they are again. And, um, and the way health works for me as it connects me with great people. And so I got to meet you. And I know that when we first spoke, um, we had an instant connection. It was a different, it, it just kind of got real, real quick. And we, I think we both sensed it. Um, yeah, I, I, we just got excited about what I, I mean, everything was in alignment with what, um, not, I mean, as we were learning about each other, getting to know each other, yeah. I felt that alignment with each, with you. Um, yeah. well, I, so I wanted to share that. Yeah. I have a really good friend, Kristen, who, um, has gone through, uh, quite a personal transformation and process. Uh, she went through a really, really difficult year last year, losing her home in the fire. Yeah. Um, and that's a massive loss in the midst of uh, which a lot of people in the area experienced. So she wasn't alone in it, but it's so personal to lose your home. Um, and you really have to come to, it's a reckoning, you know, you come to these points in life where you have this reckoning. And, and Kristen's a very dear person. Um, and then I noticed she was over the course of this year after she kind of stabilized from that massive experience that she was having a reckoning with other things. Um, in her life and her values and how she was um, approaching herself. And um, she didn't go into a lot of detail about it, but I said, Kristen, what's going on with you? And she said, well, come on this walk with me. And now she's taking long, long walks regularly, really, which I love um, being a physical person. I was like, great, because um, my husband won't walk with me. That may be changing, but he's, <laughs> he's a um, very much a homebody person. So I'm always trying to get a crowbar. So anytime anybody says I'll walk with me, I'm very excited. So Kristen invited me to go on a walk with her and she started talking about um, this Rachel person and <laughs> how she was a health coach. And I was like, health coach? I want a health coach. Goodness gracious. I'm all over the place. And as a yoga teacher, that's kind of an interesting thing to say. And one of the things I've been saying to my students more lately is sometimes yoga is hard for me. For me, I have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning and going into the studio and arriving ready to teach, to greet people, to receive and to lead. That's hard sometimes. Right, sometimes right. I'm excited about it. But anyways, um, so I was like, I would really love to have a health coach because there's certain things that aren't stabilizing for me. And then I thought about it and I was like, that's interesting. So Kristen began to tell me more about her experience with that. Um, which is really a revelation. I thought, you know, this Rachel person <laughs> <laughs> seems like um, somebody that I would love to talk to and that maybe her, maybe. Va her values, her core values and what she's trying to achieve are in alignment with mine. Um, and maybe there's dovetailing there. Yeah. Maybe we should talk to each other. Who knows? Right? Exactly. And look at us. Now we're, now we're seeing, <laughs> we're now we're connecting and, yeah. and collaborating. Right. And which is awesome. So I love this. Thank you. I, you know, there's so much, I mean, we touched on so many things when we first connected. And I think, um, one of the most, um, profound was definitely how you live intentionally and mm -hmm. how so much you, how, you, you come to this health journey, we'll call it, um, but you come to your day with such awareness. And I think that's because of who you are and what you've all are, all, you know, who you are. So you said you, um, 
you probably have you always been a Pilates instructor? Have you always been a yoga instructor? No, um, that's been uh, quite a journey on its own. Um, it's an interesting life choice being a teacher. Um, you know, there's certain people who enter into some sort of celebrity version of that. And, and we see those people a lot, right? We see them in the pictures of magazines and they of sort of construct our idea of the ideal that they're promoting, right? Um, but most people who are teachers are kind of, um, have this sort of gypsyish quality to them because it's not a super lucrative or stable career as people in their health practice go and, and yoga and Pilates is a healthcare thing. It's how you um, integrate your muscular skeletal system and your um, nervous system. And then when you get deeper into the practice, it's how you ritualize uh, care yeah. for yourself. Right. Um, but that doesn't come at first. First, you're just trying to figure out what did you say? What you asked me, want me to do what? <laughs> That's the well, and you're creating that safe space for people. You're creating yeah, a safe space. Yeah. It's so much more than, you know, yeah. standing in a position, standing in a, in a pose. It's, it's creating that safe space. So they believe in themselves again. Yes. And, and it is very empowering because once you get through the awkwardness of it, of being a beginner um, at something and you learn what you're doing, you suddenly realize that you can live in your body and feel good and achieve things and learn things and feel strong and you can grow and um, the poses have this sort of magical quality to them it's not magical it's science but it feels magical when you experience it um, of bringing you home yeah right so so i love that i um was a dance student a late coming dance student. So I didn't do dance as a kid. Um, I did a lot of other things, but I was a very um, internal self-exploring uh, kid because I was a uh, only child. So lots of uh, imagination time <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my own world, as it were. Um, and when I came to dance, I discovered that the little bit of dyslexia, I, have, I don't have a lot of dyslexia, but I have enough that when I tried to translate things into three-dimensional space, it was all kind of backwards and upside down. <laughs> and Interesting. something that you learn with somebody who's standing in front of you and you're mirroring them. Mm -hmm. You do that from a young age onward, you do it automatically without thinking about it because you've learned how to do it. And you make those mistakes automatically and adjust and you don't think about it. But when you start learning when you're 18, that suddenly becomes real awkward, real fast, especially when you're in a room with a bunch of people who have some dance experience. Right. So it can be intimidating. Yes. That translation. Um, but for some reason, um, dance and theater grabbed a hold of me like a fish hook and not like um, and that's an analogy you'll appreciate. <laughs> um, not like a little one, yeah. but like the kind you would catch a whale with, like a giant fish. It just ripped me out of the water. I was going to be an English major and I um, took a dance class as an elective and all of a sudden I was way out of English and way into dance, like way. Why do you think that is? It spoke to me. But the thing that's weird about it is that um, it wasn't very good. <laughs> I loved it with my whole heart. It was like falling deeply and fastly in love. And yet I was really, really bad. And everybody around me <laughs> knew that I was really bad and told me that I was really bad. My dance teacher was like, Anastasia, this is, you're, you're fine. We, we love you. We're glad that you're here. They didn't say we love you. Maybe mm -hmm. that was an exaggeration, but you, it's fine that you're here. <laughs> but um, don't, please don't try to make this a career. <laughs> it's not going to work out well for you. <laughs> um, and I was like, I don't know why, but I have to pursue this. And so I spent the next six years of my college experience pursuing dance. Wow. I kept bumping into these people who would see in me 
a failure to achieve their expectations. Hmm. And then I would confound both of our expectations by coming around at it sideways and backwards the way, the way <laughs> that I do. And they would discover something in me as I discovered it that none of us knew about. So um, that was kind of an interesting experience and it's probably its own story, but- I love, yeah, I just, if I can interrupt for a second, I love what you said about um, you, you had people in your life who could see some greatness in you. Um, and then you started to see it for yourself. I think that is the empowerment that maybe you spoke of earlier. But real quick, if you can kind of go back to that statement you made about coming home mm -hmm. to your body. Yeah. Tell me how that like dancing, yoga, Pilates, how do all those things that are shaping who you are mm -hmm. um, help you feel that feeling of home? Where does that yeah. come from? Well, you know, the experience of being in a dance class for me was very alienating or had this great desire to learn and achieve. It was like I could, the techniques that were being taught, but as such an inability to grasp hold of those complex text, technical aspects and integrate them into myself. Mm -hmm. um, I watch dance performance and feel the movement in my body. It was like this, I've discovered over a living my life, I have a great empath empathy, physical empathy, like a empath for bodies. So I would watch dance and I would feel hmm. everything that that dancer was translating. I would actually move around in my theater seat while I was watching, them, right? Like we get into the classroom and I'd be like, turn into a confused robot. So it was this very, um, there's a great cognitive diff dissonance between how my heart responded to dance and how my body did. And so mm -hmm. I've been looking for ways to integrate physically outside of dance class, which I wanted to be home, but it wasn't, it wasn't home. Mm -hmm. So I was in Olympia, Washington, and there was a little tiny yoga studio that was in an old house. I mean, had a staff of like five teachers and I walked by it and I was like, I'm going to try yoga. I was in my twenties and I walked in and they had a monthly membership. So you could take unlimited classes for $40 <laughs> and right. And as a college student, I was like, I can do that because I have this really flexible schedule of some classes on some days and some classes on other days. So I can just write in in my schedule, a class each day, because I paid $40, I can go to any of them. Yeah, and if I don't feel like it, I won't. But what ended up doing was um, designing basically my own intensive. So I took yoga once, sometimes twice a day, because I became so enamored with it. Because here's this movement form where I didn't have to go from do this movement to do this movement to do this movement in rapid succession. Yoga is all about poses, mm -hmm. particularly in the way the studio is teaching a lot of Hatha, which is like, do this pose, mm -hmm. get into it, breathe, deepen, adjust, mm -hmm. and a little bit more, right? So I had time to figure out, okay, my left hand's going over here and I'm gonna come across here. And all of a sudden I found my home. Mm -hmm. I, I felt at home, it, not necessarily at that yoga student, know any of those people, I, the teachers and I didn't come up with, I didn't. But with I always, the movement, with, with the, the movement, movement and the depth the of it. Of yoga, that was sort of the magic of it. It met me where I was. Mm. And because we had these long sustained poses where you would do these mm -hmm. wraps, right? right? Like a, can you see how the two sides of the brain yeah. come together and integrate yeah. and rewire? It rewired my dyslexia. Yeah. So after a year of this practice, when I went into the dance studio and also taking direction in these little pieces mm -hmm. that I could assimilate, move your left foot over here and your right leg back behind you, hold it right. So I could achieve that. 
then all of a sudden I was able to identify the parts of my body and move them in space and translate them from the teacher to myself in a much more integrated way. That's so cool. Right? right? Oh, that's got to be so wonderful. Oh. Yeah. And this is what you do. What's Tell, tell us the name of your company. Um, my online studio is called Bespoke Movement Arts, and yes. it's an integration of um, Pilates, which I could talk a little bit about, and yoga, and of course, it's all informed by um, my background in dance. Right? Yeah. Oh, what years. a great combo. Yeah. Studying yeah. dance and working for ballet companies. Um, well, so. that's a great website, everybody. Definitely go there and check out all the classes that she offers and programs that she offers. But there was something that struck me. Um, it was a, I, I know you said you were a potential English major there for a little bit, but you're, you are a good writer. And so you were sharing about resistance and I took some notes so I'm going to look down a little bit but I you know part of say my um my thing or my gig uh, I know my handle on Instagram is fly fishing for health but when you can incorporate I mean health is so encompassing you know it's mentally physically emotionally and so you really dug into the the concept or not the concept the real life resistance that we find ourselves in um, not just through the years of COVID, but all the time um, as obstacles come up. You, I, I just love how you were describing what we do with our energy. You know, you can decide to make it something positive or you can decide to make something negative. Um, you know, it can, it can help us feel strength and it can, you know, build strength or it can make us feel stuck and frustrated. And so... Um, tell us a little bit more. Um, I know we could talk for hours. We've already, oh my gosh, we're already flying by, but yeah. I really am, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you handled, or, you know, how you handle resistance, right? It's not just, it's a, it's not the fact, it's not the past all the time. Um, it's oh, always, yeah. and also how you've created kind of more um, rituals and structure in yeah. that sort of process. Yeah. Um, well, when I was younger, it was really hard for me to get to things um, consistently and to have a consistent practice. So <laughs> one of the ways I've created ritual and structure and structure is by becoming a teacher. Yeah, that's why I'm a health coach. Woo -woo. Like <laughs> accountability, right? Oh. Yeah, I'm the teacher. I have to show up. So that was one solution. Um, I don't recommend it for everybody. You have to really love it to do it um, that much. But um, even as a teacher, there's a good amount of resistance that comes up, right? Um, and uh, part of my work is Pilates training. And for me, personally, it's not for everybody, but um, the trifecta of movement is ballet, yoga and Pilates. And Pilates is this really important part. Um, yoga gets a lot of headlines, I think, because um, it is this mind-body spiritual practice, it has this sort of mystical quality to it. Um, and we're aware of it uh, to a certain degree, almost to a caricature degree. But Pilates is kind of a little bit under the radar still, even though it's been around a long time. Um, it was developed by Joseph Pilates in World War I to rehabilitate uh, amputees, soldiers, who were um, having severe muscle atrophy laying in their hospital beds. And he started working with them with a series of springs hooked up to the hospital beds so that they could use the resistance of the springs to begin to rehabilitate their core muscles and to begin to move. Um, and this is profound because not only were they able to get up and begin to move around and learn how to live in their new bodies. And I do believe that bodies are new every day. You know, we enter their very dynamic state. Um, and so every time we get up and move into our bodies, it's a new body that we're re-experiencing. Um, and not only did they have that experience from Pilates, but they also um, became uh, healthier, their immune systems bolstered. So that was the time when, interestingly enough, this is a very parallel time, the 1918 flu epidemic was happening. We've heard a lot about that. 
um, in the last year um, as we're dealing with ours. So uh, lots of people in uh, det detainment centers, hospitals, um, situations like that were dying getting ill, very ill and dying because of the flu, right. um, because of that pandemic. And he found that when they were exercising, that these people didn't get sick. It, the, and the, the um, prison staff, the detainment center staff, he was detained on the Isle of Man because he was German. So he was the Axis um, and found were recording the fact that all of the barracks that he was leading in these exercises, not just the amputees, but he also led all of his fellow detainees right. that were in his barracks, none of them got sick because they were moving their mm -hmm. bodies, right? Um, Pilates is very integrative in a way that other movement forms aren't. And it answers some of the um, stuff that yoga doesn't teach too directly. Hmm. Yoga would like you to use Pilates indirectly, uh, but it doesn't tell you about it. Right. It just hopes you figure it out in the course of the practice. So one of the things that I've done in my practice is I teach a Pilio class, which sounds like super fluff, like some weird- Hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It sounds delightful to me. <laughs> yeah. um, like some Beverly Hills class or something, like way, way bouge. <laughs> right. Um, but though it's not, it's really about uh, taking that, those ideals of core integration and figuring out how they are applied to yoga. And then taking the elements of yoga, which are more about length and release um, and bringing them into um, relief for the yoga, which is contract, contract, contract in your strength training. Um, and, you know, I think one of the challenges for me as a teacher is to figure out how to balance that. So that's that. Resistance itself is, I feel, a fact because we live with gravity. Um, <laughs> and, any, and we live with a fact of inertia. If you look at those things, which we think of as, well, that, that's physics, right? Um, but we are physical creatures. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those realities, you start to realize uh, I am challenged by coming into class, not because I am old, not because I have given up on myself and I um, abandoned my practice years ago. Um, you know, those things give you more inertia to overcome for sure. But the fact of the matter is, even if you practice every day, I am here to testify. <laughs> mm -hmm. I practice every day right now. Uh -huh. I have a day where I don't teach at the moment. I'm about to come up on a nice break. But um, even if you practice every day, you have to overcome inertia because you're always starting from not moving hmm. into moving your body. And your body is always coping with um, the the pressure of moving into something. And so inertia is an interesting force because if you're not moving, so a body in rest stays at rest, a body in motion stays in motion, right? So once you overcome that initial inertia, your conditioning kicks in. So the more you have developed the ritual mm -hmm. of coming into movement, right. the more your muscular skeletal nervous system goes, ah, oh, right. I remember I like this. Yeah. Yeah. Starts going into it and it responds more quickly and more efficiently. Right. Right. And so that is how movement helps you overcome inertia, but you always have to address it. Mm -hmm. It never goes away. It's always going to be there. So, right. Right. Yeah. You will have that, um, those times you don't feel like it, right? The right. times you don't want to, but as you get that momentum or that inertia started, that's when it starts to build and then it just keeps going. I feel yeah. that way with all our healthy habits, whether if it's drinking water, if it's movement, if yeah. it is, you know, any sort of meditation or ritual or, you know, quiet time, reading, anything. It's, right. it's taking that first step. Like, why do we always try to take a giant leap? That's right. when we burn out. That's when we injure ourselves. That's when we, you know, we just kind of get ahead of ourselves. And if we just start to take baby steps, 
moving in the right direction, all of that momentum starts building. We start to feel empowered. We start to feel like we can do things. Um, so I love that. Goodness, you are just, what a wonderful combination or trifecta that you have <laughs> to offer your clients. I absolutely love it. Um, again, I know we could talk forever. Maybe we do a part two, but um, I, I, you know, if anything, you guys have a sense now of Anastasia um, and what she offers in her, in her, you know, her, I say business, but in her practice, it is, this is a practice just like any, just like life. And what we're doing right now is a practice. Um, and so um, you don't know what you can do until you get into that motion. And I love that. So as oh, we close, so that's so great. I mean, what a wonderful, I'm very seasonal too, not just because I'm a fisherman, but I do feel like we go through so many different seasons of our life. If we yeah. pay attention, so many of us, I mean, nothing's wrong with planning what you're supposed to do, you know, what you want to be doing in five years, but really just embracing and being intentional with um, the season we're in and what gifts it's giving us. Um, yes. Thank you so much for, for joining me. I, um, I hope we get, you know, at least three and a half people who listen to this. Um, <laughs> already <laughs> I know great we're all set um but uh but if anyone would like to find you if you could um tell us you know kind of spell out your website and we'll also put it in the in the caption here um and but if you could just kind of refresh on how we can get more of you that would be wonderful um so I'm at uh www.bespokemovementarts and it's all one word so b-e-s-p-o-k-e -E, movement m-o-v-e-m-e-n-t dot com beautiful you did it <laughs> sorry for the spelling test on here uh, <laughs> well thank you again um you know you have a lot to offer you're bringing in a lot of different um perspectives. You're bringing in lots of different experience and training. And I love how you've really incorporated it and, and how you're building it, not only within your own personal journey and practice, but how you get to share it with other people. Because um, the more grounded we are, the more we all feel at home and authentic with who we truly are, you know, that's the what, what the world needs. And so, um, so thank you for offering this to so many people. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining too. My pleasure. Yes. So, I am absolutely delighted to talk about this. As you can tell, I could do it until I was blue in the face. And <laughs>